And happy Father's Day to those of you who are fathers, to those of you who are dads. Fatherhood, the most difficult job in the world. Now, mothers would say, hey, wait a minute. I I got something to say about that. A lot of times I'm slaving while that dude's sitting on the couch. I don't know about that. But here's why fatherhood is so hard and why it is so difficult. Because as the head of the household, you have to get the other people in the household to follow you. Here you have this woman who I am woman, hear me roar. I bring the bacon, cook it up in the pan, you know, and then you got all these other little mini me's. All these people have their own ideas. All these people have their own minds. All these people have their own uh, desires. And so how does this man get these people to follow him? And see, he can't do it with his gorilla strength. Girl, you better do what I say, do. Don't make me get crazy up in here. I tear this place down. You know, threatening the children or whatnot. Because guess what? Rules without relationship automatically breed rebellion. So how does this man get these independent people to follow him? How? Well, we're going to see that and we're going to be talking about that in today's study. So let's go ahead and begin reading. Let's begin reading in Psalms 128, right there in verse 1. And it says, blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. You shall eat the fruit of the labor of your hands, and you shall be blessed, and it shall be well with you. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Your children would be like olive shoots around your table. Behold, thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. The Lord bless you from Zion. May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life. May you see your children's children. Peace be upon Israel. Stop right there if you will. Let me have your attention. First thing that I want to see about this passage of scripture is this. Notice that it says, blessed is everyone who fears the Lord. Everyone. And so what that means is God is not a respecter of persons. What that means is that God is an equal opportunity blesser. In fact, the Bible tells us this. The Bible says that the eyes of the Lord search up and down the earth looking for a heart that would be pure towards him so that he can show himself strong in their behalf. In other words, what that means is this. It means that the Lord is looking for somebody to bless. And so if you're sitting there and you're going, hear my Lord, bless me. The Lord is looking for you. Again, he's an equal opportunity blesser. Now, in this passage of Scripture, and this is where we as men come in, especially in this passage of Scripture, it tells us the things that are most important to a man and the order of their importance. Are you hearing me? This passage of Scripture teaches us the things that are most important to a man and the order of their importance. And so what that means is this. That means that God knows us as man, as men, rather. It means also that God created us a certain way. Now, that does not mean under any circumstances that everything that you are, God created you to be. See, some of that stuff that you do, that's strictly you. 
God ain't got nothing to do with that. Don't be looking at your woman right now. I go, see, see, baby, see, I can't help myself. That's just the way God created me. That's just the way God made me. No, there's just certain things that's just all you. But again, in this passage of scripture, again, we see the things that are most important to a man and we see the order in which they are important. And here's the thing. It's so cool. We see the same order. We see the same pattern in the book of Genesis. Now, the first thing, the most important thing to a man is his work, his work. Now, I'm not talking about a boy. I'm not talking about a guy who just is a male. I'm talking about a man. And there is a big difference. Amen. There's a lot of guys that are walking around saying I'm a man and they're nothing but a big boy. There's a lot of guys who are walking around talking about I'm a man and he's nothing but a male. One of the most important things to a man is his work. And the reason why that's important to him is because that's the way God made him. To show you just how it's so ingrained in a man, if you ask a man that you do not know to tell you about himself, he starts with his work. Well, my name is Frank and I'm a, you know, I'm a carpenter. Or oh, my name is Johnny and I'm a, I'm a plumber. Or oh, my name is this and I'm a teacher. Or oh, my name is that and I do this. He starts with his work because that's where he gets his identity from. And that's why it's so difficult when a man is out of work because he doesn't feel like a man. In fact, he doesn't even know how to identify. Yesterday, I was a teacher. But today, because I'm out of work, I don't know who I am. I don't know what I do. A man gets his identity from his work. And so, ladies, ladies, please listen up. If your husband, if your man is ever out of work, support him. Encourage him because, again, it's it's a difficult time in his heart. It's a difficult way in his life. And so, again, remember that work is so important to a man because that's the way God created him. Think about it. When God created man, the first thing he did after he created man was he gave him a job. And what was his job? His job was to tend the garden. The Bible in the book of Genesis, check this out. In Genesis chapter 2, in verse 15, it says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. In other words, the first thing the Lord did with man was he gave him a home and he gave him a responsibility. He gave him a home and he gave him a responsibility. And once again, that's why it's so difficult when a man is out of work because it's like, I can't handle my business. I don't know how to take care of my responsibilities. And again, I'm talking about a man. See, a boy, boy don't care. Just a male, he don't care. But a man, it's like, man, I can't work. I can't do this. Well, who who am I? He doesn't know. So the most important thing to a man is his work. Now, the second most important thing to a man is his wife or his woman. Now, ladies, don't get mad. Don't get upset. What do you mean I'm second to his job? I'm the best thing that ever happened to him. I don't know what you talking about. I should be number one on the totem pole. But sorry, you're number two. And guess what? That's because that's the way God created it. Think about it. Before Adam got a wife, Adam had a job. Before Adam got a wife, Adam had a job. Ladies, for those of you who might be hearing impaired, before Adam had a wife, Adam had a job. And so ladies, if this guy come, And he's trying to push up on you. 
Yo, 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 mama. Yeah, 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 hey, 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 hey. First thing you want to know is, do you have a job? My wife told me one day she was out somewhere, and some guy was trying to hit on her. She said she started looking at her watch. Like, it's 10 o'clock in the morning. He just started laughing, because what she was saying was, how come you ain't on somebody's job? Ladies, remember what Beyonce said. Beyonce says, I don't want no scrub. Now, in case you don't know what a scrub is, she even told you in the song. A scrub is a dude who's hanging out the side of his best friend's rye. Not his rye. But his best friend's right trying to holler at me. She said, she don't need no scrub. So ladies, before Adam had a wife, Adam had a job. Amen? Amen. And so again, the second important thing to a man is his wife. Now, that's not to say, again, that she is not important to him because without her, he can't make it. Without her, he doesn't know half the time if he's coming or if he's going. Here's the thing, again, you sit down there and you talk to a man, right? Tell me about yourself. And he is saying, oh, okay, well, you know, hey, I'm a doctor, hey, I'm a lawyer, I'm an Indian chief, and you know, I'm a carpenter. Yes, I've been doing carpentry work for, you know, for the last uh, 10 years, and I worked on this project, and I worked on that project, and I have all of these tools, and I can do all of this. He's done talking. You have to ask him, well, are you married? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm married. So... What's your wife's name? Shirley. How long have you been married? Shirley! (laughs) Baby, how long have we been married? Is it five years? Five years? Then we've been married ten years. Oh, okay. So first thing he's going to talk about is, again, he's going to talk about his work. Then you have to prod him to ask him if you got a wife. And then when you tell him about the wife, again, oh, yeah, yeah, we've been married in, you know, 10 years. Okay, right, 10 years, Shirley? We've been married 10 years, whatever, right? And then again, he's done. Now, understand that does not mean in any form and fashion that Shirley is not important to him. Because once again, he can make it without Shirley. Without Shirley, he's going, I don't know where my socks are. I don't know where my shoes are. In fact, without Shirley, that man sits in a house that's full of food and he's hungry. <laughs> He'll sit there and go, man, when's Shirley coming home? <laughs> when's she coming back? See, I don't know about you guys, but the longer I stay married, the more dependent I become. I don't know about you guys, but man, you know, when I got married, man, I was independent. I was a single guy. You know, I knew how to do this. I knew how to do this. I knew how to handle all of st- all of those type of things. But the longer I stay married, the more dependent I become. And that's why I told you guys a couple of weeks ago, if she ever tries to leave me, I'm going with her. <laughs> if she ever picks up her bags, how much she leaving I'm packing mine too. (laughs) Saying, where are we going? (laughs) So again, just because she might be second, but that's the way God created him, does not mean that she is not important to him. Now the third most important thing to a man is his children. Once again, if you stop him and you say, hey, how you doing? Tell me about yourself. My name's Frank. I'm a carpenter. I've been doing carpentry work for all of these years. He'll sit there 10, 15 minutes, tell you about his work. He's done. Then you have to say, hey, 
Well, are you married? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm, I'm married. I'm married. Well, how long have you been married? Shelly! I've been married 10 years. Now, after that, he's still done. And you have to say, well, do you and Shirley have children? Oh, yeah, we got some of them. <laughs> how many do you have? Three? Under no circumstances, ask them how old those children are. <laughs> the brothers laugh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> how old are the children? Shirley! How old are these kids? Huh? What? I thought the boy was 10. The boy 12. When did he become 12? And he has to ask her how old his children are. And that's because God created him for two things mainly. One is to provide for his family. And the second is to protect his family. To provide for his family and to protect his family. So the number one thing on his mind as a man is, I got to go out and I got to get it done. We got to go to work. I learned that from my father as a young man. My dad used to get it. My dad was an entrepreneur. He had his own business. Plus he worked someplace else. And we never lacked for anything. We weren't rich by any means of the imagination, but we never wanted for anything. My dad got it done. And there was something that he drilled in his boys was, hey, you take care of your family. You get out there and you get it and you get it done. That's a part of the male DNA. Got to go to work. Got to get this thing done. And like I say again, we're talking about men. We're not talking about males. We're not talking about boys. We're talking about men. So the thing that's in that man's heart is just like, I got to go out here and I got to work and I got to get this thing done. Because, again, God created him that way. First thing he wants to do is he wants to provide for his family. Second thing he wants to do is he wants to protect his family. Once again, look at the sequence. God created man, gave man a job. After he got that job, he got a wife. After he got that wife, he got children. So those are the most important things to a man, and they come in that order. Now, because they are so important to a man, we as men, we need to be saying, well, how do I get this thing done? How do I balance all of this? Yeah, I got to get over here and I got to get this done and I got to work and all the rest of that. And I got to make sure the bills are going to get paid and everything is all of that. And then I got to make sure again that my wife is still filling me. And so I got to make sure they got time for her and stuff like that. And then I got these little children or whatnot. And I got to, how am I supposed to do all of this? How am I supposed to do all of this? How am I supposed to get all of this done? How do we get it done? First of all, we got to lean into Jesus. We have to lean into Jesus. The Bible says this. Write this scripture down. Psalms 127. Psalms 127 verse 1, it says, Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchmen stand Guard in vain. See, even though we might have these great desires again, yes, I got to get this thing done. My home, my family, my wife, my children, everybody's depending on him, upon me. I got to get this thing done. But man, yes, I can, but I can't do it to the neglect of my wife and my children. So how do I balance all of this? Again, we have to lean into Jesus. See, because guys, I'm pretty sure you, like me, have met men who were so engaged in their work that they neglected their wives and their children. I know several guys who were so engaged in their work that they lost their wives and they lost their children. I got to get this. I gotta do this, girl. Leave me alone. Leave me alone. I'm trying to. I'm trying to do this for you. I'm trying to get you this house. I'm trying to get you this car. I'm trying to get you this vacation. He's never in the house. 
He's never in the car. And he don't even go on the vacation. Because he's so busy doing this. He's not taking the proper time to do the other thing. I've known guys. I've known guys who's been in that position. Some of them I've even asked, dude, how much is enough? Your wife and your children only know you because of the pictures that they have of you around the house. If it wasn't for the pictures, they probably wouldn't even know who you were, especially the young babies. Mama, who's that dude? Oh, that's, that's your daddy boy. Yeah. What's his name? Because you're never there. And so, yes, guys, God created us as men to get this thing done. But he also has given us a wife and he's given us children. And so, again, remember, unless the Lord builds the house, they that labor, labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, those who stand and watch do so in vain. Again, we have to lean into the Lord. Jesus said this. Many of you know this passage of Scripture found in John chapter 15. In John chapter 15 and verse 5, it says, Jesus says that of ourselves and by ourselves, we can do nothing. So, man. How am I supposed to get this thing done? I got this wife. I got this, first of all, I got this boss. And they're demanding. They're demanding. And I don't know if you notice or not, but nowadays, employers and companies and stuff like that, they don't want you to work for them anymore. They want to own you. So it used to be you go to work, you put your time in, and you were done, and you went home. Now it's like beepers, cell phones, beepers, wow. <laughs> I went way back. Anybody got a beeper? <laughs> if you do, join the 21st century. <laughs> we got cell phones now. But again, all of these other things are attached to you. And so it's like, man, okay, I got this boss. He's so demanding. You know, if I get to work on time, he says, I'm late. And if I leave on time, they say I left early. And then they give me all of this work that they want me to take home and I got to do. So even when I'm in the house, I'm not really there. I'm still at work. So how do I do this? How do I manage this all this thing over here, plus do this with the wife, and plus do this with the children? Jesus, I need you. Lord, you truly said, of myself and by myself, I can do nothing. I can't do this. So how do we do this? But Apostle Paul gave us the answer. And again, many of you know the passage of Scripture found in the book of Philippians Philippians chapter 4 and verse 13, Paul says that we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. We can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. But what we have to first realize and understand is that we're weak and we can't get it done. See, before we can get help, we have to recognize that we need help. Amen? Amen. And see, because that's something that most of us, especially as men, men, we refuse to admit that we need help. We're out there in the middle of the desert, lost as two rattlesnakes, still refusing to ask for direction. Oh, baby, I got this. I know where we're going. I know what we're doing, what we're doing. Mr. Man, how come you still putting that child's bicycle together? And we done had the thing for six months. <laughs> Let me call my brother. I don't need him. I didn't need the right tools. You just bought a whole box of tools. You got a whole big chest with them. Before God can help us, we must recognize the fact and we must admit the fact that we need help. And for men, then it's hard sometimes. That's part of our pride. Our pride. 
Hey, woman, don't you dare tell me I need help. Because all that's going to do is make that pride go into a second gear. I've got this. So God is there. God says, of yourself and by yourself, you can do nothing. And when he means nothing, he means nothing. Guess who woke you up this morning? Guess who gave you strength to get here? Guess who gave you that car you're driving in? Guess who gave you that food in your refrigerator and that place where you're living at? You think it's you? Okay. It's not. It's the Lord. So first we have to say, okay, God, I got this demanding boss. I got this woman. I got these kids. I need your help. Lord, again, you said that your strength is made perfect in weakness. Lord, I'm admitting my weakness. I don't know how to, how to balance this. I don't know how to, you know, work all of this. Lord, lead me. Lord, guide me. How do I do this? So here's the thing, guys. If we want our work and our wives and our children to be blessed, we have to lean into Jesus. And once again, that's where this passage scripture comes in at. Check this out. Look again at verse 1. At verse 1, it says, Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. You shall eat the fruit of your labor of your hands. You shall be blessed, and it shall be well with you. So if you want your homes, if you want your bless, I mean, if you want your work blessed, you have to lean into Jesus. Now, notice the condition for the blessing. There's conditions attached to the blessings. And what's the conditions? The conditions is to fear the Lord and walk in his way. That's the condition. Everybody says, Lord, I want to be blessed. And God says, guess what? I want to bless you more than you want to be blessed. Then we're going, okay, then, Lord, bring it on. Bless. And the Lord says, okay, but we need to adjust some stuff. We need to, you know, change the way that we're going about some stuff. And so the blessings is attached to the fear of the Lord and walking in his way. Now, when the Bible talks about the fear of the Lord, it's not talking about fear as in being afraid. God does not want us to be afraid. I know all of us, man, sometimes you're, you're in the house or you're driving in the car, you know, and that thunder come and it rattles your house or it rattles our car. And you go, Jesus, I'm sorry. Right, right then and there, there's this fear in your heart. But God doesn't want you to be afraid of him. The word in the Bible for fear actually means reverence. Reverence. God wants us to reverence him. God wants us to honor him. And here's the thing. If we're honoring the Lord, then guess what we do? We walk in his ways. See, many times we say, Lord, I honor you, but then we don't walk in the ways of the Lord. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And guess what? My commandments are not grievous. So if we're saying with our lips, Lord, I honor you, but we're operating, we're walking in a way that's contrary to that, we're not honoring the Lord. And therefore, we cut off our own blessings. You can fast, you can pray, you can cry out, but if you're not honoring the Lord in your ways, you're not going to receive the blessings that he wants to bestow upon you. You ain't waiting on him, he's waiting on you. Are you hearing me? And so the, the, the condition to the blessings is, again, to fear the Lord, to have reverence for the Lord, a deep respect for the Lord. And then he says, when we do that, he will bless every, he will bless us and everything that is attached to us. Notice what it says there in verse three. He says, your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Your children will be like olive shoots around your table. Behold, thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. Your wife will be blessed. Your children will be blessed. So, Mr. Man, again, as we honor and respect the Lord, then the Lord blesses us. See, 
the more we align ourselves with the Lord, the more the blessings from the Lord flow. The more we align ourselves with the Lord, the more the blessings of the Lord flow from the father to the son to us as men. When we are out of alignment with the Lord, we're out of the channel of blessings. The blessings are flowing this way, but we're over here. God says, you want the blessing to flow to you. You have to move from over there. You have to get over here. Most of us as guys, we know about a car that's out of alignment. You ever had a car that's out of alignment? You riding up the street sideways, right? I mean, you're trying to go straight to your car, pulling all over here, and you're going, man, this car got a mind of its own. You're looking at your tires, and you're going, why are my tires bald to one side or to the other? How come my tires are not uh, going down or, or, or wearing out evenly? Why? Because they're out of alignment, And so it is with our lives. So many times our lives are out of alignment. When we align ourselves with the Lord, then the blessings of the Lord follow. And so again, the Lord blesses us. He blesses our wives. He blesses our children. He blesses everything that is attached to us. Gentlemen, please know and understand this. As the head of the household... The things that you do, the things that you say has a major effect upon the household. Gentlemen, hear me. As the head of the household, the things that you do, the things that you say, the things that you don't do, the things that you don't say has a diverse effect to your household. Here's the deal, gentlemen. At the head of the household, you set the temperature, but your wife is a thermostat. And she will tell you if it's hot or if it's cold. You hear me, brothers? You set the temperature. You set the thermostat, brother. But she is. I just lost it. What was I saying, baby? (laughs) Shirley! (laughs) Shirley! (laughs) I said it, but she reflects it. Right? That's why I tell guys all the time, especially, you know, guys who come back and they're complaining about their wife. Well, 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 she ain't this and, and she not that and she don't do this and she don't do that. My question is, was she that way when you married her? No, when I first married her, she was this, 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 that, another. Well, guess what, Mr. Man? You made her that way. You did that. If she was great when you married her, but now she's something else, you did that. See, understand, gentlemen, God made us the initiators and made them the responders. Procreation. We as men, we send forth the seed. The woman takes the seed and she gives birth to whatever it is that we gave her. So it's the same thing mentally, physically, emotionally in your house. Again, we said it, but she reflects it. So again, gentlemen, we have to be on point. And so again, we have to learn to to lean into Jesus. It's It's important, rather, and we're almost done. It's important that our wives and our children clearly understand that we have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Though no one join me, still I will follow. No turning back. No turning back. It's important that they see that and know that. As Joshua said, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Baby, this is how we roll in here. This is how we're doing this thing here. We're doing this thing according to the book. It's important that they not only just hear that, but see that. See, many times, again, we as men, we talk a good game, but when push comes to shove, 
we don't fight. We don't do anything. And so it's important that they know absolutely positive. The first people who know that you are a born again follower of Christ should be the people in your household. So you understand, gentlemen, it's not about the White House. It's about your house. See, many times again, we try to advocate our responsibility. The president ain't doing this. Or this person's not doing that. And the school is not doing this. Many times we're crying about, oh, we need to have prayer in school. We don't need to have prayer in our house. Ouch. And so, again, the main people who need to know, who need to understand, again, that I am a born again follower of Christ. No turning back, no turning back should be our wives and then our children, our wives and then our children. And one of the ways that your wife knows that you are serious about the things of God is that you bring her into the plans that God has given you for the family. Listen to me. One of the ways that men help their wives to understand what God is doing in their hearts, what God is trying to do in their lives as a man of God is by bringing that woman into those plans. It is important, gentlemen, that your wife, that your woman knows that she is crucial to the plans that God has given you for this household. See, as many times, again, we as men, we're like, okay, yeah, hey, I'm running this. Well, I'm going to go do this, and I'm going to handle this, and I'm going to do this, and all the rest of that. And then you look up, and she's fighting you. She's fighting you because she don't know what you're doing. You're making decisions. You're going in directions. You're buying stuff, and you're doing stuff, and she don't have a clue what's going on. So she's like, wait, you want me to follow you? Where are we going? If you don't bring her into the conversation Again, not only do you get a fight, you also do not get the help that God is trying to give you through her. See, grab this. When God took that man and took a rib out of that man and gave it to this woman, God took something out of that man and gave it to the woman. And so now she's bringing something to the table that the man does not have. And so when you don't receive that, not only are you not getting what God wants you to have, you also have a fight on your hands. Do you know what it took me a long time as a married man to understand that? Because again, you know, I was married and hey, you know, married, handle my business. I got, girl, I got this. You know, this, I, girl, hook up that wagon to this horse and let's go. I'm driving. You just, you just sit there and you just chill. You just chill. Just, just, you need what? Gotcha, girl. Gotcha. I don't need no conversation about how to go about doing it. I'm a man. I got this. But a few years into the marriage, when she was whispering a little stuff in my ear, I'm like, come on, Eve, get out of here with that. But as time went on, I started hearing her whisper. And I, and I got to give it to my woman. She never did try. She never does try to force anything. And that makes it even harder sometimes. Oh, you want to do that? And she just go in the room. Daddy, your son. You know, she don't try to, you know, she don't try to play the Holy Spirit. She just tell on me. But there was many times when she would say stuff and I'm like, but I would look up later on. Bam. There it is. Bam, bam, bam. And after a while, she started whispering. I saw Lena. <laughs> because she has something that I don't have. We guys, we know the last time we look at our woman, girl, you just too emotional. Calm the heck down. But she's like, but you don't, you, you don't feel that? You don't see that? You don't get that? But as time goes on, she's bringing something to the table. She has an intuition that we don't have. And gentlemen, when you learn to listen, you're receiving that gift that God has given you. Look at the wise. Look at John. 
seats, preacher. <laughs> I love it when that happens. Man be looking. Is she over there? She looking dead in hell. <laughs> but again, we have to learn to appreciate that gift that God has given us. So one of the things that we want to do, this is important that we're done, gentlemen. We have to invest in our wives. And what I mean by investing in our wives is we have to make them as holy and as godly as we possibly can. And what that means is, man, we have to pray with our wives. We have to open up the word of God with our wives. We have to go to church with our wives. A lot of times, again, when it comes to spiritual things, again, men step off, men back up, men don't do anything. And the woman is all over there. One of the things I've heard over the years, many, many, many times from women is, Pastor, he just won't lead. He won't lead the household. He won't lead the family. Some of you guys going, man, you know, and she's just running everything. Somebody had to run it. If you're not running it, because again, God designed her, God made her to be a, uh, a receptor to what you're initiating. But if you're not initiating anything or you're initiating things and you're not bringing her in, then she goes her own way. So guys, invest in your wives. Go buy her not only the washing machine that she needs and the dishwasher and all of those things. Get her a Bible. Take her to a marriage retreat. Send her on a, uh, a women's retreat. Can I guarantee you the more God that she becomes, the more blessed you're going to be. Because when she get mad at you and ready to let you have it, but Jesus got her tongue, hey, hey, <laughs> hey, I guarantee you be going, girl, when they having another study, y'all going where? Shoot, I was saving this money to get me a boat, but I'm sending you away, girl. Go on, do you, boo. Love you in Jesus. Invest in your wife because it will pay off. Now, one last thing. When, again, we as men, we do what we're supposed to do in the household. The man comes together with his wife. The wife and the husband come together, and they, work, they bless and they work on the children. And then it spreads throughout the household, through the community. See, because I understand something. As the family goes, so goes the community. And as the community goes, so goes the city, the state, the country, and even the world. The reason why our world is so messed up is because of the breakdown of the family. Simple as that. The breakdown on the family is the way Satan has attacked the family and if he's really going to break down the family, the main person needs to break down is the head of the household. Because, again, when that man is a godly man handling his godly business, not only is his home blessed, the whole thing is blessed. Check this out. Check this out, and we're done. Look if you again, if you will, there at verse 5. In verse 5, it says, The Lord bless you from Zion. May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life. May you see your children's children, peace be upon you. See, when you have a community of godly men working together, man, that's a powerful thing. There's nothing that can stop that. When you have a bunch of godly men working together, doing it as unto the Lord, that is a powerful thing. The Lord God says this, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek his face and turn from our wicked ways, then he will hear from heaven, forgive us of our sins and heal our land. Gentlemen, if you want the land in your household to be healed, turn from your sins, turn to the Lord and he will heal. 
It's the same thing again as a community of men. When we get together, we look around and we say, you know what? Man, it's too much death. It's too much drugs. It's too much this. It's too much of bad things going on in our community. Okay, guys. Yes, we got to go to work. But our main work is kingdom work. So, gentlemen, we're going to get together and we're going to lead our households. We're going to lead our family. Families, we're going to get together. We're praying. We're going to church. Gentlemen, we're going to get together and we're going to have men's Bible study. Gentlemen, we're getting together and we'll have nothing but prayer. That's powerful. That's powerful. And that power, again, does not just stay. In our home, it goes through. Did you notice how his home was blessed? But then he also sees the blessings of Jerusalem. That means it went outside of the household. It went outside of the family. One last scripture and we're done. Proverbs chapter 14. In Proverbs chapter 14, verse 34, it says, Righteousness exalts a nation. But sin is a disgrace to any people. Righteousness exalts a nation. But sin is a disgrace for any people. Again, our country is in the shape that it is because we as godly men are not stepping up to the plate as we should. We are kingdom men. And as kingdom men, God wants to give us kingdom power so we can get done the work of the king. Amen. Amen. And let me give you a takeaway and we're done. The takeaway from the day's study is to seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness. Then all of these other things will be added on to us. Seek first. Then the job. Then the wife. Then the home. Everything else is added on from there. Amen? Amen. Let's pray.